Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Steve Hamanover. And I know the talk said the machine that destroyed the Death Star. Well, that's not exactly correct. We know that was Luke and his X-Wing fighter, right? The, this, so we're changing it to what it actually was, the project we've been doing. It's the restoration of the Death Star plans. Doesn't matter. At the end of the night, it, the same thing happens, right? So um, to go on a little bit, so um, OK, we're going to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, University of Illinois in Chicago where I went, 1974, and how I actually got involved with computer graphics. Uh, who, what made this machine famous that we just went through the restoration with? How I acquired it? That was a question Jim wanted to uh, ask. Um, uh, 31 years later, we did the restoration. It works. Now what? Reanimating a classic, what we learned, and questions where you get to pound me with all kinds of crazy things you never thought of. So. OK, so this is me in 1972, right junior college. I liked to drag race. I had a nice car. I won some trophies. And then I went down to University of Illinois. And while I was down there, I took this series of classes, was calculus with computers. And we would go into terminal room. And for all of you ancient guys, you'd love this. We all had ASR 33s. And we sat down with the teletypes, and we wrote our programs in a language called BASIC. And then we would turn them in. And um, one day, the first quarter I was down there in 74, it turned out it's really weird, but the IBM computer they had, um, everybody put all the programs they were writing for all these classes in one single directory. There was nothing that anybody could do. If you knew the name of the program, you could read it, write it, or steal it. So I go in there to get my program for class. And this is actually a really classic story. Something like this happens. It can literally change your life which it did. So I was really mad that somebody got my program. And I went to the consultant's office. And I said, hey, don't you have any good computers? We got this IBM stuff. And somebody stole my program. How could you let that happen? And I just happened to get the right guy at the consultant's desk, this poor kid. And I'm yelling at him, oh, my program. He, says, he said, well, what's, you don't have any good computers. He said, what's that? I said, you know, like a PDP-11. And he said, oh, you want to go over to SCS? and talk to Tom Defani. He's got a PDP-11. I think he's looking for people to help uh, you know, program. And I said, oh, OK. So I go over there, walk over to SCS building. You know, I just march over there. I'm still mad, right? A door flies open. I see this guy in there. And I go, hey, are you Tom Defani? He goes, yeah. I go, is this 4114 SCS? He goes, yeah. I said, so I hear you've got some good computers. And we start talking. And I look over in the, uh, in the room. And there's this thing sitting there. And I'm going, oh, OK. Wow, that's pretty cool. There's, there's uh, uh, two women programming it, two students. Uh, you know, and yeah, I didn't have the right picture. But this, you know, it's kind of a little older. But I figured this is a good crowd, right? So anyway, so they're programming this. And I, what are you guys doing? And they're trying to make a square on the screen, right? And Tom and I start talking. And he says, oh, you've used PDP-11 before? So, yeah, I went to Wright Junior College. And we had a PDP-1120, one of the first ones. And, uh, uh, he's, oh, well, maybe you want to talk. And then he said, well, we got this. I go, what are you guys doing? Are you drawing pictures on a screen? And uh, he said, yeah, yeah. Well, here, let me, uh, let me give you the help list. Uh, we, we, we're in the, this is the chemistry department computer center. And uh, he said, we do all these crazy things for doing chemistry. We show how molecules fit together. And uh, he says, OK, well, he prints out this list about 3 quarters of an inch deep on fan folded paper. And it's this language he wrote, uh, I didn't realize he had just gotten there the year before. And he did his PhD thesis in uh, uh, computer science. And he wrote this language called Graphic Symbiosis System, or GRASS for short. It was the 70s. What else are you going to call it, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, OK, I'm kind of, OK, it's GRASS, OK, you know. All right, so he gives me this. So I'm all excited now, right? I got this computer thing. And he says, yeah, maybe you want to sign up for one of my classes. So I go home. And I read that thing from one end of the fan fold paper to the other. The next day, uh, I walked in. I showed those two girls how to do their assignment. He goes, how did you know how to do that? I said, well, you gave me the list of all the commands. He goes, you read that in one night? He goes, OK. And he goes over. There's a little uh, clipboard hanging on the door. He goes, I want you to sign up for my independent study right now. And I became a part of the Electronic Visualization Lab, or as we call it, the CGH, Circle Graphic Habitat. And that's me in 1976. I know. Look at the shirt. It was the 70s, right? <laughs> Who wears those anymore? The, uh, the Mylar, the, what do you call it? The uh, what's, uh, 
polyester pants, thank you. See, see, we all know this stuff. So anyway, so one of the things I did on this system, um, originally a lot of people did computer animation on film, one frame at a time. What uh, Dr. Tom Defani pushed us to do was do everything on video. So it was all real time. So here's one of the pieces that I did. Of course, we didn't have Star Wars. We did have Star Trek around. So uh, uh, I was actually always trying to animate an episode of uh, Star Trek. And you can see what the Vector General did. I had to cheat a little bit because we couldn't draw shaded images. But there is this P4 phosphor on the front of the tube that's a very long persistence. So if I put something on there with a lot of lines and rotated it fast, it looked like a solid object. Again, trickery. So. Anyway, so uh, that was that. And then the Star Wars project came along. And I met this really nice uh, student who came in at the time, who's been a friend of mine since the 70s, and that was Larry Cuba. And he was working with George Lucas, and he had, I guess there was four people up to bid on this movie for doing the special effect that they wanted. So he came in in like it was early, mid-76, and started working on this. And uh, what he's doing on the, uh, oh, does this work? Where's my, yeah. There we go. Yeah, you can see um, what's up on the screen is a piece of the Death Star. And down here he has a digitizing tablet. And uh, what he's doing is that's actually the picture he's digitizing, that segment of that. So, and uh, we had knobs and dials. We had interactive controls. And this is how I was uh, taught computers should work. And everybody else is just you know hunting and pecking on the keys. And we're sitting there turning dials and uh, doing uh, video things. So then Larry, uh, when he got his part done, uh, they went and set up a, a 35 millimeter film camera, and the computer was set up through the PDP-11 and the Vector General to um, uh, actually trigger the camera one frame at a time. They had to put like a whole hood over this, so it was actually uh, pretty dark. So that was that was kind of what made the lab famous and uh, where we went. Now at UIC still today, one of the things George Lucas did is he gave the lab back an actual chunk of the Death Star, and that's I, I think it's still hanging in the. Uh, uh, electronic visualization lab. It was, and I, I haven't been over there for a while, so that's kind of where it was. So, um, so I had a lot of video. I could have put this together and made this a three or four hour talk, but for brevity, if you go to uh, YouTube and just type making of computer graphics for Star Wars and Larry Cube, it's probably the first thing that'll show up, and it's a really nice little 10 minute uh, piece. Uh, so then uh, a few years later, Tom Defani calls me up and said, hey, uh, do you want the Vector General and the PDP-11 and 45? We're going to throw it out. And I go, what? You can't throw this out. It's a piece of motion picture history. He goes, well, you got a truck? Come on over and get it. So we did. Yeah, we went over there. and got, Actually, he gave me three Vector Generals and one PDP-11. So one of them, eventually, after 20 years, we realized we had no use for. So I uh, sent that one to its early grave and kept going. So then. Um, in the meantime, based on what I had learned with the grass language, um, I wrote another language based on that myself uh, uh, called Elgrass, which worked with lasers because we were doing all these events. And uh, it was really cool, but we could never get the pictures big enough because the video projectors of the day could only go so big and then the pictures get fuzzy and grainy. So uh, I thought we should be doing these with lasers. So I started a whole company and proceeded to help start a whole uh, industry with that over the years. And um, you can see one of the pictures uh, on here they shot uh, of me. And then another one, uh, one of the customers, everybody knows the best. Yes, we do all the laser work down at the United Center for the last 23 years. So I've seen more basketball and hockey games live than anybody should ever have to sit through. But you know, <laughs> I, yeah, <it's, laughs> you want to do the work, you sit through the game. So Michael Jordan walks by, hi. You know, it's like that was back in the day. So anyway. Um, one of the things that happened, which was kind of really cool, in 2007, I actually received the uh, University of Illinois Alumni Achievement Award for writing the Elgrass language and being able to, uh, you know, disperse this to so many people that bought our systems, you know, worldwide. They thought that was pretty cool. So, um, so then, then we jump ahead to 2013, and the grass system had sat around. We would show it to people that would come by and say, hey, we did Star Wars and we had a picture we uh, kind of taped up on it and said this is what it was done. And then uh, the, the university lab calls me up and says, hey, Steve, uh, Channel 11 wants to do a, a film about the, uh, all these special effects we did for Star Wars. Uh, we told them, you got the computer. Uh, they're coming over. Uh, make the lab look good. And uh, when they come over, 
Um, you know, the machine, yeah, this was after we took the plastic off and blew all the dust off and it had been sitting there and it's like, uh, we never actually got the 45 to run and the problem seemed to be that uh, all the power supplies weren't set to the right voltage. You set the power supplies at the same voltage, all of a sudden the front panel lights come on and we can start entering stuff into memory. And one thing led to another and we went by there and then uh, uh, Kathy, one of my business partners, said, well, how does this thing work? And I said, well, I have a seat. Here's the little programmer's card. We're going to teach you what Octal is. And she goes, what's that? I go, well, first you have to learn binary, and then you can learn Octal. Let's see if you can get your name to appear on the terminal. And I, I think it's funny in this photo that the laptop is there because there's so, so much difference between the two generations of computers. I'm on the internet, which didn't exist back in the 70s when they built this. So. Um, and then uh, uh, Channel 11 came in and they filmed everything. And when they walked in, they said, can you turn it on? I started laughing. I go, that's like going down to NASA and say, can you turn on that Saturn V you got sitting in your museum? And it's like, it's going to take a while. It's going to, they gave us, they were giving us a week. We kind of pushed it more into there. And, and you start doing something like this. And, you know, how do you even figure out what to do? And then uh, Mike was laughing, my other business partner. He says, well, too bad you can't just call deck service, right? And I go, he's laughing. I go, that's not as funny as you think it is. Give me a few minutes. And after a day or so, I figured, well, deck got uh, bought out by Compact. Compact. Compact got bought out by 3M. 3M got bought by Hewlett Packard. So I go to Hewlett Packard in their phone directory, and I find the guy that used to be our deck service guy. All of us are ex Motorola people. So we had this guy out, and he had the deck service guy and I were really good friends. So I call him up, and he's so excited to hear from me. Steve, oh, we were just talking about going down to the planetarium. My wife and I had seen your laser show years ago, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I saw, oh, how are you doing? Unfortunately, he had cancer, and he had like, literally a month left. But he was very supportive, and I told him, I said, John, I have a yellow pad of paper with your handwriting on it. Tell me how to use the diagnostic programs you gave me on this RKO5 disc pack you know, from 1985. And uh, we proceeded through, we got the show done and everything, and unfortunately John is no longer with us, but uh, the memory of the fact that we could just still call deck service was kind of interesting, you know, so that was kind of fun, so. Uh, and the video they did for Channel 11, you can just go uh, the Star Wars connection on Google, uh, UIC, and uh, you'll see the Channel 11 video that's, uh, that's up there. If, you, if, if it's too fast for you guys, you can just ask me later. And I'll, I'll run that through again, so. <clears throat> okay, then 2017, wow. EVL, the Electronic Visualization Lab, calls me again. Okay, I should also mention that uh, um, these are very good friends of mine over the years, so they'll call me for things and we'll always say yes. Uh, it's 40 year anniversary Star Wars. Chicago Tribune <clears throat> wants to do a story on how we did the special effects. And of course, again, they use the term, Steve, make the lab look good. So, the, you know, and the Tribune guy comes out, and he says, okay, well, now we've moved out to Elk Grove Village and moved the machine again, all 800 pounds of it. And you can see over here, uh, the, uh, uh, that's the Vector General, uh, 1145. We also have a PDP 1160, which is kind of hidden behind the panels here. We just thought we'd show this one off more to the TV audiences because it's a much more colorful front panel than those binary bit days, right? So, uh, and uh, um, uh, you gotta have R2D2 here, right, when you do this? <clears throat> so, um, all right, so we get it up, and what we did is we cheated one of our laser graphics systems. Uh, I had talking to, I was talking to Larry Cuba, the artist who did this, and I, I call him up, and this is back in 2013, I said, hey, Larry, you don't know what happened to your data for Star Wars, do you? And he's just like, there's this pause, and he goes, Steve, you expect me to know something I did 36 years ago where I left it? And he goes, well, as usual, you're right. It's here on my mantle with all my Star Wars toys. I'll send it to you. So he sends the disc pack, right? And it's like, and we get it. I don't know if I put the, uh, no, that was the next one. Uh, so, so I take the disc pack apart. We clean it. We put it in the PDP-11. The thing boots. I couldn't believe it. 36 years later. So uh, that's how we were able to recover the, uh, the data. One of the nice things is when the uh, Tribune guys were in, and this guy was really nice. You know, I keep telling him I'm not the star. Larry is. I'm just the guy that kept the hardware from going into obscurity. So I'm, I'm doing a uh, photo up here from our laser computer system. It's an XY monitor. Lasers are XY vector displays. So it was a pretty easy thing to hook up a couple of wires. And we actually were able to display it. But it took a while. I took his data, which was in grass format. It's an ASCII, so you can read it. So I wrote a translator to go to my 
format for my uh, Elgrass laser systems, and then we had to translate it again to the new system we're using from a company called Pangolin, who makes laser graphic uh, systems, and then we got it to display on here. And I thought it was really cute. I said to the, guy, the Tribune guy, I said, hey, let's do this. So I'm actually running the scene that this was figured, that this was featured in, in the Star Wars film when they're going through the whole battle plan at the end of the movie. So that was, uh, that was really, really cool to actually show that 40 years of technology, uh, just you jumping 800 pounds into the palm of my hand. So that was pretty cool. So this one, you can just go to Google and type UIC Death Star. And then that's a nice little 10 minute thing. But also, uh, please read the, uh, uh, the video's nice because I'm in it. And, 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 and you get, well, it's, that's not why it's nice. It's nice because, yes, I'm in it, but I'm in it, but you get to see the machine and what we were doing. But the nice thing is, please read the article because it talks about all the people who really did all the hard work to, uh, to kind of make that happen. I'm just kind of the caretaker of this now. Uh, okay, then last year, we jumped to VCF. Scott Swayze, sitting up here, raise your hand. There we go. Uh, stops by after VCF and said, hey, I was talking to Jason, and uh, I understand you got this computer that like did this stuff for Star Wars. That's really cool. I'm into vector graphics. Let's start talking. And he kind of pushes me towards some of the tools. If uh, any of you are working on any PDP-11s, uh, the guys at the PDP-11 GUI program from RetroComp is amazing what you can do with that thing. It allowed me to read the RK05 disks we have and store the data, because we really didn't have any other way to preserve them. Uh, so that actually worked pretty good. So then uh, Mike, my other partner, says, well, let's go. And what we originally had was uh, Tom Defani had sent me a mag tape that he made in 1979. Now, he had moved from Chicago out to San Diego five years earlier. And I, said, I called him up. I said, hey, do you know where the Star Wars data is? He goes, oh, yeah, it's on a mag tape. And it's OK. And I said, do you know where the mag tape is? He goes, yeah, it's, it's, it's in my hand. I go, well, well, wait a minute. You moved five years ago? You made the tape in 1979, and it's in your hand? He, well, I keep it handy. It's like, OK. <laughs> and he's, well, you seem to have the computer to read it, so I'll just send it to you. So he boxes it up and sends it to me. So we were getting ready to uh, go through the, uh, the, the TU-10 uh, mag tape drive here and uh, fix that. We had to find some silly things like you know, rubber uh, hoses that had deteriorated because it's a vacuum column drive. And we're going in there. So then Mike and I start on the circuit cards. And we actually started getting it to the point where it was working, and because Scott was so nice and showed me that tool, we could read the RK05 disk drives, and now we can look at the stuff on a PC with better editing tools. So uh, uh, we found out that we actually had all the source code for the grass language on the disk pack. We didn't have to fix the tape drive. So, so the first thing you want to do is you start looking at the power supplies. Now, if you can see Kathy, my other partner, I say, hey, we'll get her to go in the rack. She's little, right? She'll fit in there. So you can see her kind of back here. And, 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 and if you notice, the lights in the front panel around, so she's back there while it's on. And she got a little nervous and said, you sure I can go in there? Oh, yeah, it's only 24 volts. Come on. Don't be a baby, you know? She's in there tweaking it, and I'm outside. So that actually went uh, went pretty good. And she really gets in the, the work that we do, you know, too. So it's always nice to have somebody small enough to fit in the Jeffries tube or a PDP-11 <laughs> rack. So, you know, send, send them off to their demise. So, um, uh, and then uh, uh, David, one of our uh, students, our intern last year and this year, um, I kind of told him what an opportunity this would be. We found out that one of the, uh, we thought we had a bad memory card, and it turned out there was actually a bad head on the disk drive. We put the alignment pack in and started looking at the signals, and one of the heads had a signal about a third or a quarter of the size on the oscilloscope as the other one said, hey, we got a bad head. And Mike comes in laughing, ha, 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 where are you going to get an RK05 head? So I reach up on the shelf and pull out a box, and I go, John Smittle gave me a pair of heads in 1985. Someday I might need them. I got the heads, right? So, so David comes in and he goes, wow, these are big packs. How much data do they hold? I go, are you ready? He goes, yeah. I go, 2.5 megabytes. And he just stands there looking at me. He, he was 19, you know. Which is, he says, no, this is not your phone. So, okay. So I said, you want to do this? He says, yeah. So we, we changed the heads. And you can see down here the, uh, he's doing the head alignment. And he didn't want to be satisfied until those, those bumps were straight. So uh, he got the head alignment done really well. You can see the alignment pack. Oh, and then Mike says also, where are you going to get an alignment pack? So I reach in another box and go, well, John Smittle gave me this back in 1985 in case I needed it. So uh, we got it. Uh, he's always good to point out the things that could cause problems. But uh, we, we were prepared. So 
So he's doing good. And now David knows how to align an RKO5 disk pack. What use that's going to be to him in the future, we don't know, but uh, that's, that's what he did. So, so uh, okay, here you go. And we got our sound on. Uh, there we go. You got to have inspirational music in the background, right? And the vector general's not doing anything yet. It's still sitting there. So, so we got the 1145 working. That was a really big, uh, big moment for all of us. And finally, which we made these really cool T-shirts Kathy got for us this week uh, for vector general. Um, yes, we still put the decimal on there. So, uh, so we start looking for that, and it turns out that um, you look in the back of this thing, and we knew nothing about it. When I wrote the LGRAS software, I, I, I wrote it from the point of view of knowing what the user would expect. I had no idea. I never looked at the code. I never knew how the hardware worked. This is one of the most complicated and impressive things you've ever seen. When we started on this, when uh, Scott came in a year ago, I called Jim and a few other friends up, and then everybody, Mike and Kathy, and everybody said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to spend some time. And she says to me, she goes, yeah, but don't we have a business to run? I go, yeah. She goes, well, why are you going to do this? I go, well, remember I kept saying one day I'm going to fix this? Well, this is the day. So, or at least the day we start. It took us literally almost a, a complete year to do this. This thing has about um, 92 cards in it. They're all TTL, and a lot of the functions are spread across several cards. The CPU part is like eight cards in itself, and you got to figure out what does what, and what do you do, and where do you start, and of course, what do we find out? Um, uh, uh, we got to pull all the cards out and clean the edge connectors. Kathy decided it was easy to use a rubber mallet to put them in carefully so we don't jar them at all. So, um, you know, just whack, whack. And uh, uh, again, more power supply issues. Jim and I are playing with this, and we can't get the power supply to stay at 5 volts. And I said, hey, you know, grab that fuse on the front. I don't know if you can see this, but um, there's a fuse here that's labeled 25 amps. And the thing was so hot, you could cook marshmallows on it. I mean, you literally couldn't touch it. So, you know, we take it apart, he pulls this boat anchor. What does this thing weigh, about 50, 60 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty heavy. And uh, we take it in the shop and take it apart, and what do we find out? There's a 20-amp fuse holder with a 25-amp fuse on it, labeled 25 amps on the front panel. I guess how they built those things. So he said, what do you got? I said, I got another 20-amp fuse holder. Oh, let's put that in. And it's, it's nice and cold now, so it's, it runs nice, and we got our power supply voltages up, and that really does mean everything when you're playing with the old uh, uh, TTL logic. But the other problem we had is you can't find documentation on this anywhere. Well, uh, Tom, when he, Tom Defani, when he gave me the PDP-11s, gave us three or four boxes of manuals, and the, we're talking, you go through the paper, there's nothing in PDFs, although somehow Jim found something online somewhere that was a manual that we didn't have, which, which actually helped us a lot. But uh, so what uh, Kathy did, she went down the street to one of our neighbors and borrowed a 11.5 uh, by 17 uh, copy machine that we could scan it with. So she sat there for um, weeks of document scanning. And uh, what was nice is after they were scanned in, we have a nice big you know, 42 inch printer so we can print things up. And these are like all C size drawings. So it kind of, I kind of in the bookmaking business. I look like I'm at a construction site, except we have construction of chips, not you know, I beams. And Jim comes in, he goes, why'd you make them so big? I go, we're old guys, we can't see. Come on, you know, and, and you can take a marker and you can mark them up. You can see this is one that we were marked up because when we started with this, we didn't know which board went where. So and now we can pretty much tell you that this was a very interesting project for, for several of us because it's sort of like taking a graduate level course with no instructor. And, and, and you have to figure it out and if something smokes. And, and when you do a restoration project like this, you have to be really, really careful because if you make a mistake and blow something up, you can't go get another one. So, you know, we, we could have made some boards and we thought about it. And he found a uh, document that said VG test card. He goes, hey, you know where this is? And I hadn't seen that before. And he shows me the picture. And I go, well, we were over at the University of Illinois in 2013 when we did the first thing with the Channel 11. And I was looking through their archives of stuff, and I actually had the thing in my hand, but I didn't know what it was, and it didn't say Vector General on it. So he shows me that. I call up the, the lab and said, hey, can we come over? And, she, and, and they told us, yeah, come on over. So uh, 
We go over there, it was gone, they'd thrown it out. That thing sat around for 25 years not knowing what it was. Just before we need it, it's gone. So, so we kind of made our own. So, so then uh, with Scott's help, uh, uh, we had a nice collaboration. What he's doing, he's, he's trying to make an FPGA version, which you probably saw in the trade show. It took him almost a year. That does what the Vector General does, but weighs 799 pounds less. So uh, yeah, he's trying to do that. So he, he was very instrumental. He was going through the software, the source code, and he was telling us what some of that was doing, and I was telling him how both the hardware and the software work. So between the two of us, whenever one of us had a problem, we could call the other guy and say, hey, how did you, wh where's this address? What do you think? Oh, I found that last night in the code. So both of us went, uh, uh, went through that with the GUI, so we started loading uh, test programs. And then, of course, what's the first thing you want to do? Can you talk to it? And the nice thing about that front panel on the 1145 is you can program and watch the bits go back and forth and see what's going on. So this has um, A to D converters on it. Can we read the dials? Well, we found out at some point, I don't know what we did, but all of a sudden we got a number out of it that wasn't zero. And if you turn the dial, uh, you could read it. That's sort of a normal uh, I.O. thing that it does, so you can just read the values of the dials. And then I said, hey, let's see if we can turn on a light bulb. How hard could it be to turn on a light bulb, right? And there's a function switch panel. You can either push the buttons and read them, or you can send a command to the lamp register and turn on the light bulbs. Well, it turned out to be a little more um, difficult than we thought, because uh, to turn on a light bulb, you actually had to get the processor to run to do an instruction, which is called a uh, register change instruction. So we got that down there. Then it's OK. So then we get started, and Jim says, hey, can we draw a picture? And it's like, oh, yeah. So we start looking at uh, some of the diagrams here. No, here's a, here's a diagram in the book. Oh, this is easy. Transformation matrix. You got an x, a y. Goes to the vector generator. goes out to the tube, right? And then we look, and he goes, hey, did you look on the next page? And I go, oh, no, what's there? And he says, well, there's another one. It's like, oh. It's the same diagram, but there's more D to A converters. They added a couple more post-rotation. OK, no problem. I think we can kind of do that. And we kind of cheated because we haven't got the rest of the system running yet. So we took an oscilloscope, put it in XY mode, and we just kind of hooked on to the back of the cards for the XY registers. But we actually were writing to the machine, and we were um, being able to control the D to A converter. So we draw our first square on the oscilloscope. So we consider that a win that week. So. And then, uh, and then I keep looking in the manual, and it, 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 oh, wait, there's another one. OK, another diagram, which is why we couldn't make the vector generator work. And uh, more DDA converters on there, right? And OK, so I start programming these. You have to figure out which one of these is and what you have to put in here to send a signal out to this. And finally, it goes out, vector generator, hey, there's the display monitor. So I'm working on it, and I can't get it working. And then Jim comes in, hey, did you look? Two more pages in the manual. It's, oh, there's another diagram. More D to A converters. So now you've got like almost 20 D to A converters, and you got to sit down. Oh, look, here's some equations that tell you what's going on and how you do rotation and how you do everything else and how you get the signals out of here. And it's like, okay. And, and Scott's trying to do the same thing, and he just found, believe it or not, there's a misprint. One of these equations over here, Scott can tell you which one. There's a plus instead of a minus or the other way around, which is probably why his Death Star crushes when you turn the knob one way we were figuring out. So anyway, so we, we finally got to the point where we could get through all of those. And lo and behold, one night, oh, there was another problem. There's a card we couldn't figure out. It looked like everything was working, but I couldn't get an image up. And it turned out there was a bad transistor on one of the cards. You can have up to four monitors four sets of dials, four keyboards, because this, I, I can't believe this thing can run four monitors. So like four guys you know, in the Army working on tanks, tank programs or something at the same time. Anyway, so I said, well, I could just plug it into monitor number two till I get the transistors. Back to eBay, find some ancient transistors, put them in, and then it came out. So this is the first, first thing I actually got to work on there. And Jim says, why is, it, why, why is it twisted like that? That's a square. I said, OK, so I had a couple of values wrong in the matrix, OK? So, you know, slap me. So then we went through it and figured out some more. And guess what? We finally got the square to appear correctly. So then uh, there was another one that was listed in the manual for the test card that we can't have because it got thrown out. And I actually got that to work. So as we're learning more about this, trying to figure out what the vector general instructions are, the way this machine works, it's uh, got a DMA interface. It has no memory of its own. It shares memory with the PDP-11. So you put something in the memory to PDP-11, and you point its address registers. 
at where you have your vector data and say, okay, execute this. And we were so happy that it still did it. I mean, they're really, and all this stuff we've done with this, a lot of it's a learning curve, cleaning context. If you looked at that back plane, there are literally thousands of pins in those connectors, and they all have to be clean and they all have to work. So, um, oh yeah, then we had a setback one night. We were going through everything, and then what happened, uh, you know, one of the front panel switches breaks. Where are you going to get that, right? So we had to take it apart. Oh my God, my machine's coming apart. Uh, do a little surgery and find out you can buy something similar from CNK. It's just not the exact same switch. So uh, uh, got to improvise with that. So, and then uh, guess what? It works. We got it fixed. In fact, Kathy was instrumental that night. I thought something was wrong, and I started changing chips on the front panel. Uh, one of the front panel control boards, and she goes, this trace looks like you broke it here, and it's like, ah, oh, and it was working again, so we got the whole thing, whole thing fixed. So, so we go back to debugging again, and we started out with an 8-bit logic analyzer, and you look at the waveform diagrams for how this thing's supposed to work. <laughs> yeah, okay, so then we get a 16-bit logic analyzer. Well, then I think, do I have one here? No, yeah, we keep going. We ended up with a 32-bit analyzer. <coughs> there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of signals to look at. So we had uh, David back here, our engineering student. He's, he's manning the, uh, uh, the logic analyzer. And we go through it and we find out we had a couple of bad chips on the interface between the machines. There was a problem in one of the test programs I wrote. You couldn't do multiple interrupts at the same time. The machine would kind of hang. And we finally got that fixed. Um, and yeah, we let him do it. You know, you get a 17 or 19 year old in there, he thinks he knows everything and his brain's faster. Okay, it is, we're just not gonna let him know that, right? So, so uh, uh, that worked out well. He was really happy to actually see that. So, uh, so we, that's where we thought it was in the interface cards. And <coughs> again, as we go along, finally we get there and then Jim finds after we fixed everything, what's causing the last interrupt? It turns out that on the front panel of the Vector General, there's a gap of about three quarters of an inch. And you have, to, you have to see the rest of the machine to understand it, but there's like a lazy Susan bearing that this giant like, you know, 80 pound monitor sits on or whatever it weighs. And somehow over the years that it was stored because the top was stored in an area where we had just junk like wood or metal pieces, whatever. Um, if you can see the resistor's broken, that's like a 10 ohm resistor and the power, the five volt power goes in there. With that resistor broken, it gets no power. So the board sitting is nothing, so it's always pulling the interrupt. And we were trying to figure out what was causing the problem. And Scott goes, did you check the other interrupts? Because one of the interrupts has multiple things that can cause it. And we traced it down to this, and we fixed it. And then, uh, this one play? Yes. I knew we got somewhere. And that was about 4 o'clock in the morning. And I said, oh, get around the Death Star. I said, no, we can wait. We can wait. So I wait one more day. And we finally get, bring up the Death Star. A lot of things we can do in real time with this system. So that's kind of where we were, uh, we were at with that. So, and then uh, here's uh, Jim comes in. He goes, oh, you got to work and let's go. So you can see this is like what your demo was doing, Scott. But uh, he's actually able to manipulate this around in real time on the screen. Okay, you know what we're all waiting for, right? You want to see the Death Star Trench, right? Well, um, we tried some testing, and then, of course, you get into the whole computer animation thing, and Lord knows I've heard uh, so many stories from all the years I've gone to the uh, computer graphics conference, SIGGRAPH, about people trying to do things. And what they did when they made this, it wasn't generally known, but they pushed this machine to its very limits of what it could do. The language called GRASS, they made a special version where they cut it down. They took out the floating point processor software, which was done in, uh, uh, on grass, and they, they removed all the commands they weren't using to get it down because the vector general, uh, the image data has to share the same memory that the program's in. So the bigger the program and the more features, the less space you have. And this thing literally took every word of memory that they had. So, um, and it's like, okay, so how, how, and then of course, there's the issue of now that you got the computer working, how do you, how do you figure out what all the programs do? And I said, well, like I said, I'll call Larry Cuba. He sent me the disk, right? I got your disk, how do you use it? So we had a long talk and uh, he said to say hi to everybody. He's out in Los Angeles. And uh, so we start going through there and then of course, 
Uh, one of the things that you'll see um, later on, there was a camera mount originally that was made on the Vector General for doing film. We had a, uh, I think it was a 4,000 frame per second 60 millimeter film camera that we never used, <coughs> but they made the nicest bracket for it. And I figured, okay, so what I did, what do we got today, right? We have 35 millimeter film, now we have this, we have 4K uh, cell phones, right? So uh, I bought a selfie stick, and that's half the selfie stick, and then there's the part that you expand out, you know, the telescoping part. Okay, throw that away, we don't need that. And the clamp that holds the cell phone, well, gee, that just mounts on this mount with some optical bench parts from one of my lasers, right? And it just happens to sit right where you want it. And uh, so, of course, uh, I, I talked to Larry uh, Cuba. My other friend, Larry Lesky, was one of the engineers at the time that was helping to build all this stuff, and he wired up the uh, interfaces for a lot of this stuff, some of the A to D converters we used. And uh, uh, I was told that he just taped uh, the function switch box one of the lights, function switch 15, it turns on when the frame is ready. When it's rendered, it's up on the screen, it's all done, it'll turn on a light and they typed, uh, tied a uh, photo cell to it so it would trigger the 35 millimeter film camera, go to the next frame. Okay, that works. So how do I get my cell phone to do that, right? Well, the selfie stick has a Bluetooth interface in it, right? You push the button because if you touch the camera and you move it, you lose the registration and your frames will jump everywhere. It's like, okay, we can do that. So now, uh, the VG is Bluetooth compatible, right? So, so, uh, whoop, hang on. That's what I was able to do the other night, so. Now, also, yeah, you won't see it. I'll have to play that again. If you notice, there's lines in there. They're supposed to be points. And the P4 phosphor on the front of that doesn't fade fast enough. The cameras are so sensitive in our cell phones, it picks it up, right? So, uh. We got that, and then of course, you know, you gotta do the trench animation test, right? There's something like 1,500, 2,000 frames to do, so, so, oh, I don't know why it does this, there we go. So we got a little bit of that to work and put it together, and it's like, that was so nice after all the years uh, to, uh, to have that together, but doing this, so. All right, so what did it take for us to do this? Uh, nearly a year, five engineers, one engineering student, the, my entire staff of all of us at Aura Technologies, a lot of friends. It's amazing what happens when you buy pizza for people, what they can do. Uh, so about, about a dozen of us all together. Uh, Scott missed out on some of the pizza, so I owe him. So, uh, And then uh, the next step, we want to restore the TU-10 mag tape drive because I think what's on that tape is all the really good work from the lab that we did back in the 70s. So all the image data should be on there in the programs. and. Uh, uh, we'd like to restore the data tablet so we can actually, oh, we don't know if it doesn't work, we just haven't plugged it in. And then, uh, oh yes, as I mentioned, I, I got more than one of these things. Uh, you know, Jim thought that was great because we could just pull spare parts out of the other one. And even though these two machines were made one or two years apart, the ECOs, the engineering change orders, the differences in, this, in, in, in the boards are different enough where you can't actually plug one into the other machine. Some of them you can, but you look at this and go, oh, it's going to be an ECO nightmare. So, uh, and then of course, you know, get a life, right? Because what else do we do? We stay up all night working on this, so. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I lied to you guys about the Death Star plans. I've been up every night till 6 a.m. for the last week. We captured um, about 2,000 frames with my camera. And believe me, when something goes wrong, the computer stops. The problem is the camera on the cell phone has got a timeout of about one minute. It was taken 52 to 57 seconds to render a frame. If it takes a little bit longer, the disk drive, that RKO5 disk drive, that thing was working. It was every second, it was just going and doing it. If that stops, you gotta start over. You can't touch the camera. You turn the camera on, it comes up sideways. It's like, oh. then you move it, you lose your registration, you start over, or the computer stops. It's done that a couple times, so. Anyway, um, are you ready, James? The battle station is heavily shielded and carries a firepower greater than half the Starfleet. Its defenses are designed around a direct, large-scale assault. A small, one-man fighter should be able to penetrate the outer defense. Pardon me for asking, Steve, but... What good are snub fighters against that? <laughs> well, the Empire doesn't consider a small one-man fighter to be any threat, or they'd have a tighter defense. 
An analysis of the plans provided by Larry Cuba has demonstrated a weakness in the battle station. The approach will not be easy. You are required to maneuver down this trench and skim the surface to this point. The target area is only two meters wide. It's a small thermal exhaust port right below the main port. The shaft leads directly to the reactor system. A precise hit will start a chain reaction which should destroy the station. Only a precise hit will set up a chain reaction. The shaft is ray shielded so you'll have to use proton torpedoes. Man your ships and may the force be with you. Thank you. I was going to try and do that speech live at 7 o'clock this morning. I'm sitting in my lab reading it and thinking and thinking it. I couldn't do it. I said, I'm just going to record this. I, you know, you see, there's so much you can do all night long. And after the point, I go, oh, I'll just leave a space for Jim. So that's pretty cool. So, Okay, so um, questions? Yeah, we have, we have a microphone, so please wait for the microphone to get to you before you ask your question. Any questions? I've seen that show. The guy runs around in the audience with that. Uh, do you have any information about how many of those vector generals were made and who else has one? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of those. I know they sold a lot of them to the military. I mean, I'm sure there's probably half a dozen missile silos around the country that probably still have one that works. Uh, I, I know that was a lot of it. I know they, some of them were for academic research, which is what we had, although we actually did build a Death Star with it, you know. But, um, well, we did. So, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we had people using it for architecture and things, but as far as I know, uh, I don't know of any others that might still be around, but I'm sure, like I said, I, I know from what I've been told uh, from Vector General, they did sell a lot to the military. What does the 1160 do? Oh, okay, well, we've got two, two com yeah, <laughs> that's a very rare machine I just happened to have. I had one in my basement for several years. I bought new for like $2,400 back in the 80s. Uh, we're actually using that right now to run the Vector General. We have a little problem with the 1145, it does work. It'll run all the test programs I have <clears throat> for the vector general machine, but when we run the grass language, it, it chokes on something. We think it might just be a power supply discrepancy between the two backplanes, because we have to uh, jump one to the other. So right now, all that was done on the PDP 1160, what you just saw. It seems to run a little more reliably, and it, 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 everything's in the same chassis when we run it, so. Really? Come on, you guys got another question, right? Oh, I knew it. So oh. are you, are you going to give this talk at SIGGRAPH? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just thinking I could get myself, Tom Defani, Larry Cuba, the guy who actually did it, and I thought we could do a remote uh, a video feed back to my lab and run the computer from SIGGRAPH. That's what you would have to do for SIGGRAPH. You'd have to run the whole thing remotely. Yeah, I've been toying with that idea the last couple of weeks. I just haven't talked to everybody yet. But I think, wouldn't this be a great talk to see there for the pioneers? And you could you know, have somebody with the latest, greatest, you know, highest res ray tracing, and it's like, dude, we got vectors, you know. <clears throat> uh, the other is um, Computer History Museum in uh, Santa Clara would, might be interested. I was actually thinking, you know, my kind of idea was that it's a shame. George Lucas was going to build a Star Wars museum in Chicago, and we thought, wouldn't it be great to keep this hall, Chicago technology, right here? So that, that was kind of a thought that maybe, you know, he would want to have that in his museum. But uh, yeah, yeah, the computer museum would be a good place too. But I'm not ready to let go of it yet. Although Mike says, what are you going to do when you sell it? I go, I, I have another one. Oh, you know, so, you know, <laughs> you know. We don't know. That, that's going to be probably another year to get that, you know. And nobody's going to want to work because you can only buy so much pizza, right? Well, I was saying you just give the talk it there. Oh, know? yeah. I would, I would, sure, sure. Yeah, that we could do. Oh, one of the things we were thinking about, um, I don't know if any of you guys are interested, the machine was way too big and fragile to move. Uh, we were uh, going to have an open house at our place in Elk Grove Village tonight, so I didn't know if would anybody be interested in coming over, you know, for kind of a late night. We'll turn it on, and you can play with the Death Star and see the actual machine. Okay. Now, I, 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 might, I might need a show of hands because there was talk of coffee in White Castle, but we need to know how many to, 
order if we were doing that. So, Andy's counting. You want to multiply by three, Andy? Nobody eats one. Okay, that, that's, that's reasonable. So I was asking how long it took for them to get a Crave crate. Didn't you always want to buy one of those 100 cheeseburgers, you know? So anyway, um, oh, go ahead. You had another question, too, over here? Yeah. So now that you have the Death Star plans, do you expect to be contacted by Disney or anything like that? <laughs> I'm going to jail after this. No, I, no. I, I, I was talking to my partners about uh, calling, what's one of the groups, the, uh, the garrison groups where they dress up like... Uh, Stormtroopers, I thought it would be cool when I finished the talk if they came in and marched me out tonight. That would have been. <laughs> they, they told me we've spent enough money on the Vector General this year, so. But uh, yes, uh, what else? Anything? I, like I say, I have so many tidbits, I wanted to keep a lot of it out. The, 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 the thing that Larry Cuba did, where he talked about how he went through and did everything and digitized it and put it together. I mean, to me, it's like I knew what a monumental exercise it was, but going through things, seeing what they did to the machine. We, we never did anything in the lab that was still framed like this, that was shot one frame at a time. And this is what made the whole machine so famous and the whole, uh, the whole thing. And it's, it's such a joy to finally, after seeing it sit, you know, sit around the warehouse and get moved from place to place. And one of these days, and it's like, well, that's today. So, and thanks to you guys, we gave the extra effort to push to get it all done for you. Yes? How much data is on that tape? Megabytes? Worth? Oh, well, the disk pack sold 2.5. Now, you're sitting down, right? Yeah. The mag tape can hold 40 megabytes of data. So we figured there's probably close to about 15 to 20 RKO5. We don't know what's on the tape. So now, I want to be careful because you know what NASA's gone through with the old moon tapes? You start to use them. We, uh, our, our old laser shows used to be on reel-to-reel -reel audio tape. And taking one of those uh, after 25 or 30 years, the tape gets gooey. What they did is they, they have a mylar, it's a clear mylar piece of plastic, and they put glue on the other side, and then they put the ferric oxide particles on there. Well, over time, the glue, is, the glue kind of falls apart, and it gets gooey, and the tape sticks to each other. What they kind of should have done now, in retrospect, right? Um, they should have made two thinner pieces of tape, put the particles in the middle, and put uh, mylar on both sides, and they would have lasted like a lot longer. So yeah, so 40 megabytes is what's on there. So we, we want to see what, what's on that tape. But I want to be careful. We may only get to read it a couple of times. In the sequence in the movie, it went further than what you've got. Do you have the data for the rest of it? Or was that done a different way, where the missile actually went in? Oh, which, well, this, this was pretty well, OK. What we found out, yeah, OK, the other night, it takes, it takes about a minute or so to, to render a frame and get it up there. So if you've got like 2,000 frames and VCF is coming up at the end of the week, uh, yeah, so you know, it's, like, it's like I had to make a decision. But the one program, uh, it, it, it had not, it had, I let it go like 17 or 18 modules, but we never got to the end of the trench. And without that exhaust port, we don't have anything to do tonight, right? So I found out where the exhaust port was and jumped ahead in the program so it would actually finish it up. But if you watch the movie, this might actually be about as long as it was or a little bit longer. But that sequence, I think he went all the way around the Death Star. The interesting thing is uh, what Larry Cuba did was um, uh, he finished that in 1976 in April. And they wanted it a month earlier. They made him give it to them a, a month earlier, I think, or maybe it was long, sooner than that, before, uh, before he was ready to give it to them. So he never finished everything he wanted to do for them. And then, uh, then they changed the design of the Death Star. If you notice in here, uh, the dish for the weapon is in the center, and they moved it up. They didn't tell him that. They just did it when they made the models. So that's why the two things have a discrepancy in there. Yes? Jim gets a lot of exercise at these, uh, at these things. Uh, I just want to say, I, I had heard a story that when they were making that, that um, they had cooled the computer down so much because they thought it was overheating and it was actually, uh, they were running into problems because they were making it too cold. Is that, is that true? Uh, I thought I had heard something about that. Uh, it was. It wasn't this computer. It could have been okay. a different one. All right. Maybe he's the one in R2. You know, he's always a little hothead <laughs> droid thing. So, no, no, I, that, I, I know that's been done for a lot of things. I know I have friends at the Sony Pictures, and they would tell us stories about the California wouldn't give them any more power because almost, almost more of their power went to cooling their supercomputers than it did to actually running the computers to do the rendering. Because that's always an issue. We, we can't figure out how to make silicon that, that doesn't get hot. So, but no, not this one. We had a, just a 
the, this, I mean, we're running this, we're, do, we're pretty much doing the same thing they did. Uh, the thing I think that would get hotter, worn out more, would be um, uh, the heads on the RKO5 drive, because that thing, I mean, it's, it's just constantly running. He'll bring up a frame, calculate the perspective view, because we, we couldn't do perspective in real time <clears throat> on the vector general. So he'd bring it up, it was done mathematically through calculation, make a new frame, save it to disk, delete it uh, out, out of memory, then get another one up to another one, and when he gets five frames built, he brings them up on two, three, four, five, and literally, we're talking like a couple of hundred bytes of memory left. I mean, that's how far they push this machine to get the detail in it, and they bring them up, and then it triggers the camera, and then it erases it and starts all over on the next one. We're sitting there, with, like I said, with the watches waiting. The camera's going to time out. The camera's going to time out. So, uh, next, another one. <clears throat> I, oh, with, you, with your U work at UIC and in that general time frame, were you guys ever collaborating with uh, the guys out at University of Utah and some of the stuff they were doing, or did your work kind of predate that? No, I knew we knew of those guys, but we didn't do it. I don't know that we did any direct work, at least not that I was involved with. Um, if you've looked around here, or if you were probably making this video instead, there's a lot of emulators that are running as far as the PDP family, their 11 family. Are one of those emulators we have close enough to the real thing that it could actually substitute in a little 8 by 11 box for? That is what Scott's doing, but there's a bug in the FPGA code on the PDP 11 that won't run the DOS operating system. You want to answer that, Scott? Yeah. <clears throat> I do get a lot of exercise in this. You do. <laughs> Yeah, so I've done uh, recreations of video games like Tempest and, and, and Vector Games in FPGA, and that's something I'm doing. But uh, so I met Steve a year ago and wanted to, wanted to recreate this hardware in an FPGA. And so what I use is two things. Uh, to, you're familiar with uh, SimH. So I wrote a crude SimH vector general driver that would basically parse the instruction set of the vector general for drawing the three-dimensional lines, x, y, and z. And then it would spit out those numbers, and then I could extract that out into memory and then run it on my FPGA to actually display it. And so um, uh, I'm kind of a period, I like FPGA recreation, so I use SITSA's, uh, for those of you who heard about uh, PDP 2011, you can see it, uh, PDP2011.net. Um, he did a great FPGA implementation of an FPGA uh, that does the 1170, does the, you know, the 20, the, the four and the five, uh, things like that, or all the Unibus side of things, because uh, it's Unibus. And so we were using that and it was working great. We were running the test programs on it. I was running grass on it, um, or I wasn't. I was running grass on SimH, but when I tried to run grass on the FPGA, uh, uh, we discovered a bug. Actually, the guy who wrote the Java PDP 11 um, 70, uh, Paul N, I can't think of, uh, uh, discovered the bug where, um, for some reason, DOS batch basically overwrite or writes data in the buffer that it's going to load from the disk. And since the disks are slow, it, don't, it doesn't matter because it just overwrites it later. But in the FPGA and uh, the Java, it was too fast and it just overrode immediately. So we've been having issues with getting the actual program to run on a FPGA PDP-11 right now, but it will eventually. And all the test programs ran just fine. So. And then you'll be able to hold it in your hand like your cell phone. The, the funny thing is about computing power, we should be able to do this whole thing you just watched in real time on your cell phone without even thinking about it. We just have to rewrite all the code and get it in there. The processors are definitely fast enough. But what Scott's doing, you'll be able to hold it in your hand instead of having eight guys help you pick up your portable computer. 